Hello and welcome. Thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, the welcome's from me, Michael Scott in Oxford in the UK, and from my joint convener, Sanford J. Ungar, usually in Washington, DC, but actually today uh, in Indiana on holiday. So we thank him for joining us for this. Our eighth jointly promoted event between the Future of the Humanities Project and the Free Speech Project. The latter is sponsored by Georgetown University and the former by Georgetown's Humanities Initiative in association with the Las Casas Institute for Social Justice, Blackfriars Hall, the University of Oxford, and Campion Hall, the University of Oxford. Together, the two projects consider issues concerning human dignity, rights, cultures, histories, traditions across a wide spectrum of educational activity, policy, expression, and aspiration. In a moment, I'll hand over to Sandy, who is the director of the Free Speech Project. He will introduce today's distinguished panel and moderate the ensuing discussion before I come back again uh, to chair the question and answer session in about 40 minutes time. From the start, you can type in questions to the panel by using the button at the bottom of your screen. That's the Q&A button. These questions will come to me during the session and I will try to put them in a coherent order for the panel to consider. We do urge you please to ask your questions and to start asking them early so that we can get them into that kind of order. And I will try and put as many as the questions as possible to the panel. So with that, I hope you enjoy today's event and over to you, Sandy. Thank you, Mike. It's wonderful to have everybody with us this morning and discuss another important issue of our time. I'll introduce quickly the panelists who are with us. Edwin Tambara is Director of Global Leadership at the African Wildlife Foundation. Edwin is originally from Zimbabwe and uh, has a unique perspective on these events and issues that we're talking about. Julian Redemeyer, who you'll notice has a fire behind him, is in uh, South Africa in the heart of winter today. Uh, he is director for East and Southern Africa of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. And he is the author most recently of Killing for Profit, Exposing the Illegal Rhino Horn Trade. Lord Peter Hain, who's in London today, former minister in Labour Party governments in the United Kingdom, author, of, author or editor of many books, but most recently of a thriller based on the illegal trade in rhino horn called the Rhino Conspiracy. Sharon Guinep is an investigative journalist, author and producer with us today from Hoboken, New Jersey. And uh, she is affiliated with both the National Geographic Magazine and the Wilson Center in Washington, DC. Uh, lastly, but certainly not least, Nirmal Ghosh, the US Bureau Chief of the Straits Times of Singapore, a great friend of the Free Speech Project in Washington, and an eminent wildlife conservationist in his own right. Uh, I'd like to start with Edwin Tambora this morning for a, 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 a sort of brief overview. We'll all endeavor to be brief so that we can cover as many issues as possible and have a good conversation with each other. But Edwin, from your vantage point, uh, how do we keep the issue of endangered species on the agenda of individual countries and international organizations when they have so many other things to worry about from day to day. And it's sometimes hard to convince people that this issue matters. Great, thank you, Sandy, for such a great uh, question and a great platform to be involved in. I think from our perspective as the African Wildlife Foundation, we certainly uh, recognize the competing uh, priorities for countries, particularly in Africa, and particularly in this pandemic, the need to ensure that um, there are measures put in place to, to ensure that we do not have uh, loss of human life. But also, as, as you mentioned, so how do we keep uh, the issue of endangered species on the agenda? For us, it's been a case of making the connections. Uh, what is the importance of these species to the survival of human beings? What is the importance of these species to the ecosystems 
upon which we rely on. When we begin to make these connections for whether it's for local communities on the ground or for policymakers or globally, people begin to understand and this is how we've been able to keep the issue of endangered species at the fore. And to conclude with that, maybe I can give an example of what happened uh, in Rwanda and Uganda when the pandemic set in, those countries get quite a lot of revenue income from gorilla tourism, but they realized the danger to continuing tourism to mountain gorillas. And so they came to a decision that it was important to stop the tourism for a while until they had adequate measures in place to ensure the, that tourism could be conducted in a safer uh, way. So there are, there are places where people have made, already made the connections and they are able to make the right decisions that support both uh, people and uh, the endangered species. But in some places, it's still uh, a lot of work needs to be done for people to make these connections. Sharon, uh, I, I, I want to turn to you for some perspective on this issue, the, the breadth of this issue and how important it is. I think to some people, it doesn't occur to them that this is often uh, a matter of environmental concerns are easy enough to, to project, but there are criminal issues as well. And I think that that may be surprising to some people. You're muted if you would turn off your microphone on, and that would be great. So, you know, I think there's a number of different issues here. Um, obviously there's, you know, individual species, many of which are endangered, many of which are being, you know, pushed, you know, towards endangered status by extensive poaching and, and trade and, and both legal and illegal trade of wildlife. Um, there's also, you know, it, it's been put front and center that um, wildlife trade also poses serious human health potential issues here with, with COVID, zoonotic disease, you know, diseases jump between humans, wildlife and livestock and, and with international travel and trade, you know, these emerging diseases can, you know, spread around the globe, you know, in, within days. Um, but also in the last decade or so, there's a number of leaders and uh, institutions that have placed environmental crime and wildlife trafficking on the world stage as a national security issue in every country. It breeds corruption. It's run by international cartels. There are a few militant groups involved. Um, so it's not strictly an environmental issue, which tends to you know, rank very, very low on the priority list for governments, but national security is up here. And um, you know, there's been much greater attention from a number of you know, uh, UN agencies, UN Office on Drugs and Crime, and um, Interpol has been paying much more attention. There's a much greater need for international cooperation so I think, you know, looking at this as, as a whole issue, you know, it's individual species, it's ecosystems and the impacts by pulling out different species and, and how that changes and whole and may seriously damage an ecosystem. There's zoonotic disease and there's national security. Peter Hain, you have had a, a, a wide ranging career and, and uh, been involved in many issues, anti-apartheid issues in in your native South Africa, and and then of course working on the settlement of the crisis in Northern Ireland as a member of the uh, Tony Tony Blair's cabinet in the UK. How did you come to this issue? Your your book is called intriguingly the Rhino Conspiracy, and so and I, there you go. Uh, how 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 did how did this come up in in your on your agenda. Well, Sanford, thank you. And uh, hello to everybody. And thanks for joining us. I, I, I was visiting a, a wildlife park in uh, South Africa, my, the country of my childhood until I was forced into exile with my parents during the anti-apartheid struggle in the 1960s and witnessed armed guards around rhinos um, 
chomping away in the undergrowth and then learned from the rangers there. This, this is this marvelous park called Tula Tula in KwaZulu itself. If you've heard of the Elephant Whisperer book, then that's the, uh, the park that it's based on. And uh, I, I understood that, that these rhinos needed full-time protection, but were often vulnerable even with that. Now, I, I vaguely knew about poaching, but I then started to investigate, having talked to the poachers and realized, oh, sorry, talked to the, the, the uh, rangers and realized that behind poaching is an international criminal syndicate and a political superstructure protecting them. Corruption and the rhino conspiracy is about exposing that, really, the corruption and the poaching. And why it's all connected, and, and picking up from Sharon's point and, and Edwin's point, is if you think of the, the guys on the ground who are doing the poaching, poor African in the main uh, uh, men using machetes to hack off a rhino horn or guns to kill it in order to do so, uh, they are desperate for jobs. That's not in any sense to excuse it, but why are they desperate for jobs? And if people think about wildlife as nothing to do with them, except it is nice, but actually I want a job and I want a decent standard of living and I want equal opportunities and economic justice, actually it's all connected because those poachers are poaching and risking their lives and often getting killed. And the big crime bosses in East Asia don't care about that. They care about their supply of a rhino horn powder or elephant tusks or whatever it may be, or lion claws or tiger claws in order to, to fuel their demand. Uh, so the poor African poacher who risks his life and kills wildlife is actually in the same position internationally as other people stuck in poverty. So it, for me, these issues of wildlife protection and the, the endangered species uh, that humankind is uh, devouring almost daily uh, by our destructive activity. It's all connected to the economic system and the type of politics we have. And that's the way I see it. And uh, although my book is a thriller, be under, underlying the, the, the story, which uh, Julian was kind enough to describe as, as gripping, um, is actually this wider picture. We can come to Julian in just a moment, but Nirmal, uh, Peter Hain mentioned the criminal bosses in Asia, and and that's sort of your turf. So I wonder if, if you want to weigh in here. Yes, it's quite a thank you, Sanford, and hello to everyone. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, I just recently, in fact, <coughs> wrote on a new report that estimates that the meth trade, the methamphetamine trade in Southeast Asia actually grew 19% last year during the pandemic. And as we know, the, the international illegal wildlife trade, which thrives in that part of the world, is a part of that same illegal network run by transnational criminal groups, right? So clearly they were able to breach border controls and so forth. So it is, it is a reasonable, reasonable assumption to say that uh, wildlife trafficking has not slowed down at all in Southeast Asia or, or anywhere in Asia. With uh, some exception, perhaps in India, there are some places where um, there have been good practices. Uh, uh, Kaziranga, where the one, -horned, one of the one-horned rhino habitats in Assam, Northeast India, remains uh, a good example of good protection. Again, you know what Peter was saying, a lot, a lot eventually depends on old-fashioned protection on the ground. Uh, rhinos and tigers are like gold in the vault, really. And uh, mm -hmm. you just have to simply protect them. Uh, you do all the rest of the stuff, ensure that the community surrounding the, the protected areas on board and so forth, you must do all that stuff. You must do development, eco-development, tourism, everything in balance. But nothing beats proper protection. And in fact, in Thailand, we had good news last year with the tiger uh, population for the first time in years, actually ticking up slightly in the Western forest complex, which, is, which borders Burma. And that was frankly due to good old fashioned foot slogging protection. It's not, uh, not due to a great enforcement on, on wildlife trade and trafficking, unfortunately, which remains, it is up there in, you know, recognized as transnational organized crime, but it is not given the real uh, priority it actually des it deserves. 
Uh, Julian, your your perspective, and certainly from the name of your recent book, is on organized crime as it's involved in in these issues. Can can you describe this network to us a, a little bit more to to help us understand? Because it's not it doesn't get a lot of attention compared to to yeah. some other issues. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think I've, I mean one point I would like to make is that I you know I've written quite a lot about rhinos. Um, um, and for me, minors are a symbol of uh, much greater societal issues and ills. Um, in a South African context, it's about inability to tackle organized crime. It's about rampant corruption. It's about land issues, people who have land, people who don't have land. It's about inclusiveness and, and people who, who are excluded from conservation. And sadly, with South Africa's history, the history of apartheid, um, you know, Africans uh, in South Africa have, you know, um, largely for, and it continues to this day, been excluded from national parks and the benefits of national parks. Um, I think the point that Peter made, so if you're looking at the broader network, um, your challenges are that uh, the corruption runs throughout the illicit supply chain, through many of the countries, the supply countries, the routes that have followed. Um, you, starting off at the bottom with your foot soldiers, the people who are recruited from towns and villages to go into national parks and poach. Uh, we did a project where we, uh, when I worked at Traffic, the International Wildlife uh, Trade Monitoring Network, where we interviewed convicted poachers and people who've been arrested for poaching. Many of these are people who've never held a rifle before, who were completely unskilled. They were given a rifle, they were given ammunition, they were sent into a national park. They're the complete opposite of this image that we have of uh, heavily militarized poachers going to national parks. That certainly does happen in parts of Africa, particularly Central Africa with, with um, elephant poaching. But in the Southern parts of South Africa, you, you, you don't have that level of expertise necessarily. And um, there are gangs that are obviously more effective. And then from there, the rhino horn, let's use rhino horn example, it moves very quickly out the park. Um, it is moved away from the park generally by couriers. Um, I've seen taxi, you know, taxi companies being used runners being used and then moved into various hubs and transported um, across, you know, out of the country. In the old days, it used to be very easy because um, rhino horn was a high value, uh, relatively small commodity that you could put in your hand luggage, smear it with toothpaste, cover it in a plastic bag to hide the smell, um, taken on, on a plane with, that doesn't happen anymore. So it's, it, there's a consolidation process now that needs to take place. The use of ports, the increasing use of hubs we're seeing more and more shipments being found in, in ports uh, more broadly that are going out. Um, and the challenge that you're facing is that these networks then extend through uh, numerous legal jurisdictions, through numerous countries. Um, and to try and have any real impact, you need to be able to disrupt that, uh, that syndicate along the length of that illicit supply chain. And that calls for uh, collaboration between countries, that calls for exchanges of information, that calls for the correct application of the legal processes and procedures that are available both in international law and in, in national laws. And sadly, even now, despite this being an issue that's brought up at every uh, law enforcement conference, um, it, those, those instances are quite rare. I mean, we've seen some really nice examples where there's been close collaboration between enforcement agencies. Uh, some in China, for instance, collaboration between Chinese customs and some of their their counterparts in, in Africa, similarly with uh, US Fish and Wildlife and some of the, the investigations that they've been involved in. But there's a lot more that needs to be done. And the only way that you can deal with, with transnational networks and transnational syndicates is if you can apply pressure, and not just arrest a kingpin or arrest a foot soldier because they quite frankly are replaceable. You, know, you remove a CEO or you remove someone who makes the tea in their office it's not gonna have that much of an impact on the organization. But you take out the accounting department, you take out the people who are doing the manifests and doing the shipping, uh, the people who are controlling the movement of the product. That's how you do real damage. And that's what we need is targeted investigations, focusing at those levels of, of criminal networks. Just a quick point, uh, Sanford, if I may, going back to your point about Asia and also picking up from what Julian said, corruption. There are, in, in, in Southeast Asia, the, the, so, the so-called kingpin wildlife traffickers are actually quite well known. They have been named, some of them have been named and, and indicted, uh, um, sanctioned by the US Treasury, for example, but they're still doing fine. Most of them are living free, they're well known and they're doing fine. 
I think if I just add, add, if I if yes. I may just add a brief point to Julian. add to what Julian said is that this is all. I think people need to understand this wildlife trade uh, and the poaching that is at the bottom of it is on the equivalent of drug trafficking and human trafficking. Uh, it is a massive and organized crime on a global basis. This is big crime and should be seen as equivalent to those. It shouldn't be seen as something just smaller and on the side. It is right in the middle of those international criminal networks that m most people are more familiar with. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point, Peter. And I wonder why there's not greater awareness around the world of these issues. And, and why aren't more people speaking up in, in the way that they could to draw attention to these things? And I, you know, I don't like to blame journalists or media for every problem in the world, well, despite the tendency of other, others to do that. But both Sharon and Nirmal and perhaps Edwin might, might have something to add on this point of, it, it does seem sometimes that stories of wildlife poaching of, of these issues are, are in this area of exotica, you know, that they're not, they're not really, it's when, when some international correspondents don't have real stories to work on, uh, war and pestilence and, and things like that, then they'll turn to cover wildlife and poaching almost as if it were a quaint issue. Uh, how, how, how does that happen? Sharon? Well, I, uh... I think there definitely isn't enough mainstream coverage. There never has been. Um, I, you know, I think it's been very hard to land environmental stories always. Climate change, finally climate change is getting some attention. I think wildlife trafficking has been getting far more attention over the last year plus because of the pandemic. Um, you know, my, my problem with much of the media coverage I see is that it covers, you know, a bust of like, you know, 30 tons of pangolin scales, but it doesn't look at the larger context of the issue. You know, we don't know that, you know, cartels are the masterminds of this business. We don't know that, you know, wildlife is the fourth largest illegal commodity, you know, in the world. You know, we don't know that it's, you know, about a $20 billion a year business. Um, you know, we don't, we don't hear the background and I truly feel that there's not enough journalists that really dig in and do the investigative work to expose, you know, more than just, you know, a, a poacher busted on the ground, um, but look wow. into the deep net networks. You know, like um, Julian wow. worked on a, um, an investigation with Al Jazeera a couple of years ago, this film called The Poacher's Pipeline. And, you know, he, he traced, um, you know, rhino horde trade, you know, through a couple of embassies to the, you know, top of South Africa's like, you know, security. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's very deep, important stories to tell. And, and it's not something that, you know, you whip out on a two hour deadline. I mean, there's, there's really deep reporting that needs to be done and, and not enough of it. Yeah. Julian, do you want to elaborate on that point? And Edwin will come to you in just a, a second. I think, I mean, you know, just from, from my perspective, I think one of the things, I, I was a, an investigative journalist. I was looking into corruption issues primarily um, prior to getting, you know, developing an interest in wildlife trade. So that's very much what you've described. Um, and I stumbled on an, a story about someone who's smuggling weapons across the border from South Africa into Zimbabwe. Um, a farmer here and those weapons are then being used to poach rhinos and it became this pursuit of trying to find out where these weapons are coming from who were the people involved eventually ended up tracing one of the firearms to a farm attack in South Africa where an elderly couple had been held up and it was quite a quite a violent farm attack but the thing in some ways that drew me to it was just this crazy idea that there were people out there who are willing to kill and die for a piece of rhino horn you know, something like that. And it would go to any lengths to get it. And the cast of characters that that pulls in. Um, and corrupt diplomats, certainly in it. I mean, the, the, Viet, the embassy of Vietnam in South Africa has repeatedly come up 
in discussions and being implicated in illegal wildlife trade. Uh, similarly, the, the case that Sharon's talking about involved uh, diplomats from the North Korean embassy in South Africa um, who were smuggling rhino horn and were, were caught uh, and, and other North Korean diplomats who've been involved smuggling rhino horn to China. So it, it pulls together this extraordinary cast of characters and, and touches on so many different elements in society, touches on so many elements in government and in corruption and in law enforcement and inefficiencies of law enforcement. And beyond that on community issues, you know, the, the real sort of socioeconomic impacts on people's lives. Um, that it's, it's, for me, it's, it's probably one of the most fascinating stories that you can do. You know, it's, it, it really digs deep. And I think from there, it, you know, it moves into so many different directions. There's politics, there's corruption, there's climate issues. Uh, there's the, the impact, there's land issues. Um, so I think if you take a broader view, it's not just uh, the rather simplistic stories, which you know, were quite legion back then, which was a rhino is poached, police are investigating, there's a distraught farmer. I think it's about going behind the headlines. Edwin. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah, I, I think Sharon and, and Julian have touched very well the shortcomings in the, in the international <clears throat> media and, and the likes. But for us, we, I think there is an added layer, which when we look at our think, you know, there have been stories like that. They come up, but people, you know, question as to, you know, yes, it's, it's wildlife. You know, just last year, a number of rangers were killed in, um, in, in the DRC in Virunga. And it lasted only a few hours in the news and that was it. So I think that disconnect for people is what leads to sometimes really attention being limited to, to these kinds of issues on, on IWT. I think the dis disenfranchisement that has been there between conservation and African people um, also leads to these issues that we, we are seeing now, probably even at, at international media, where people are saying, well, when it comes to wildlife, you want to make a lot of noise. But when this wildlife is affecting people, uh, we don't hear as much. So I think for us, it's more about how do we make the connections for people to actually realize that these are their resources. These are resources that could be adding to economic development of the African continent um, that are actually being taken away from the continent by, by criminal gangs. And so making those connections will help people realize that it's an important asset. It's it's our culture, cultural heritage. It's our asset that needs to be protected. And so sometimes when people see uh, these stories in the international media, their attention span is not so much um, because of how they experience conservation on the ground, that the way they experience it is different from how it's portrayed in the international media. And so those are some of the things that we need to address so that when, when the masses on the ground really understand the importance of these species and how these species can actually be an asset that contributes to their aspirations, then they are going to be able to, to support it. And, and it's across the board, whether you are dealing with uh, journalists on the continent as well, or you are dealing with private sector or other sectors or policymakers, those shortcomings are there because the connection with conservation and the plight of these endangered species is, is still weak and people are still struggling to, to see this as sort of as an African issue more than a Western issue because for a long time, conservation has been seen as a arena for Westerners. So how do we make sure that we, we bring back those connections for people to be able to to see these endangered species as an, as an asset which they need to support in their protection. Julian, <clears throat> using one of the charming features of Zoom a moment ago, you raised your hand. Did you want to add something here? Um, that was actually accidental, <laughs> but I'd be happy to. Um, I mean, I, no, I absolutely, I agree, with, I agree with the points Edwin was making. I, you know, with, with our people, there's no conservation. And I think that we, we need to be move away from exclusionary conservation practices, fortress conservation, as it were, 
where you know we we create these very militarized parks um, as as has been happening because ultimately that is just a, a holding game um, you look at places like the Kruger National Park in South Africa which has been at the center of the storm of rhino poaching uh, for a decade now um, you have rangers who have been putting their lives on the line daily um, immense psychological stress. There have been profound consequences to them. You know, these are people who didn't sign up to be soldiers in a war. And ultimately, you know, over the last decade, um, the Kruger's lost about 70% of its rhino population. It still has a, a, a fairly sizable rhino population, but the results have been, have been quite dire. Um, there is only so much that teams of rangers on the ground can do. Um, you know, Aside from that, we do need um, buy-in in, you know, trying to develop uh, community conservation practices, trying to get people involved, trying to, to find ourselves in a place, and I fear that that's quite a long way off in South Africa, where we've had these vast socioeconomic disparities, where up until the late 1980s, actually up until the mid-1990s, Black South Africans were largely excluded from national parks. Um, you know, we need to find a way where we go beyond this, where people see this as part of their national identity. Um, and we're not there yet. You know, for, for most people, this is not even an issue in their daily lives. Their, their daily lives are a struggle to find water, to find electricity, to find schools for their kids, to find, um, you know, medicine, uh, clinics. Um, and, and that's been worsened by the pandemic in so many ways. Um, you know, I think we're only now beginning to see the real socioeconomic impact of the pandemic. Um, and governments are flailing around. Environmental departments are taking budget cuts. This is not an election winning issue. Getting vaccines to people is an election winning issue. Um, ensuring that people can get their jobs back is an election winning issue. Um, and that's the real challenge that we're facing. You know, we have to find ways of, of bringing people closer to conservation, but then also dealing with this not as a sort of our boots on the ground approach, fortress approach to conservation, but how do we take this beyond and look at the, the syndicates and the networks that are actually causing all the damage? Peter. Um, picking up on that, I wonder whether we are telling the story in a, a simple enough way. I mean, what is involved here are a lot of, there's a lot of expertise, including in this, on this panel, the wildlife expertise, excluding myself, because I'm a a political activist, a, a politician, uh, first and foremost. And I think we need to, to be able to tell a story that, for example, the work that Sharon's doing um, and writing about, about the connection between the pandemic and the way we are invading the space of, of wildlife, uh, about the, the poverty that encourages poachers to risk their lives and the political and economic structure that is actually creating inequality for most people around most of the world. We have to tell a story more simply. So I don't think it's simply a question of blaming journalists and the media. Uh, I think it's partly our own fault. Uh, and maybe that's something that Georgetown could look at, uh, Sanford, uh, uh, is, is, is bringing people together to tell a story more simply. I mean, wildlife is seen, uh, and I hope people won't take offense at this, but seeing there's something cute, people you know like the look of rhinos, That's they right. love elephants and so on, but they don't see it as part of their daily lives. And actually, we've got to tell the story that shows that it is. I think that's a more articulate way of putting the issue I was getting at earlier of how to make this meaningful and routine. Sharon, um, I, I think it would be useful if you had, if you could tell us a little bit about which countries are the worst offenders in, in this respect? Before I step into that, I, I, I just want to um, put out there that I'm really hoping that this current, you know, UN, uh, UN decade on, you know, preventing, halting, and reversing the degradation of ecosystems worldwide, you know, really <clears throat> does something more than just an empty initiative. Um, I'm, I'm looking at this as a real opportunity, and I, I hope that there is true action. Um, as for the consumers, um, it is really important to note that many <coughs> of these products are really expensive. They are high-end products, and um, many. China is the largest consumer. Rhino horn, um, 
you know, tiger bone wine. Some of these products are exorbitantly expensive and they're, you know, bought and, and used um, almost as status symbols. Uh, normal people, you know, middle-class people are not buying some of these products. In fact, um, there are investors in China that are actually buying tiger bone wine and, and putting it in a vault, almost like gold bars. It's worth mm. a lot of money. So I think it's important to, you know, realize that there's many levels to this and, and it's not necessarily, um, you know, middle-class consumers that are buying all of these things. Um, and again, it's anything from, you know, pangolin scales, pangolin meat, you know, tiger products, you know, rhino horn, et cetera, et cetera. But um, very few people realize that the United States is the second largest consumer of illegal wildlife products. Um, very, very different products, very different trade. You know, here in the US, it's much of it is focused on the pet trade, uh, amphibians and fish and reptiles, um, also meat and a huge trade in, in even just tourist trinkets. And people you know, don't realize that conch shells or you know, um, tortoise shell earrings um, you know, are endangered species. So um, you know, it, it's far less volume, very different products, um, but um, you know, there, a lot is um, discussed about you know, trade from and you know, to Asia and from Africa to Asia, but there's also a huge wildlife trade from, from Latin America that largely goes to the US and Europe. A lot of that is again, birds, fish, reptiles, you know, many, many other species. So you know, it really is a global issue. There, there's wildlife trade happening in every country on the planet. So I, I think it's important to consider the scope and the consumers and the importance of dealing with um, both consumer demand and not only having adequate laws on the books, but actually enforcing them. You know, there are countries that have great laws and there's no enforcement, so there's no deterrent. So, you know, the, those are just some of the other issues I think we need to consider. Right. Uh, Nirmal, one of the things that rarely comes up is the role of zoos and uh, other seemingly well-intentioned institutions and all of this. Is, is that something you have any thoughts about? Zoos, yeah. Um, well, you know, there are, there are a handful of zoos which have improved uh, in, in, in recent sort of decades because public opinion has generally, at least conservation, uh, the conservation world has basically tried to hammer home the point that zoos have nothing to do with conservation. And in the public mind, it's, it's often conflated. Now, some zoos might have endangered species breeding programs, but you will be hard put to find a zoo which has actually reintroduced a species into the wild. That is a myth. And we had the famous case of the Tiger Temple, which Sharon knows, can tell you, you know, can talk for hours on in Thailand, which was considered a wildlife conservation um, place, you know, with tigers roaming around. It wasn't that at all. In fact, it was an underhand wildlife trafficking uh, operation. Now, I, I'm not saying zoos do that, but you know, maybe maybe some still do. But uh, zoos, essentially, what is very important is for the public to understand that zoos do not have anything to do with wildlife conservation. And zoos, for me, they reinforce the anthropocentric view of this whole issue that wildlife is something to be managed. That you, know, you see this in the discourse all the time. You you talked earlier about journalism. Um, so one thing about journalism is that big, big cable news, big media houses were driven by a news cycle and the news cycle moves very rapidly. The second thing is that the, even when a species or, or, or an incident is talked about, it, the language is often laced with this, um, with, with, for example, the China, recently the herd of elephants in China, which captured the imagination of everybody because they had drone footage of the elephants sleeping in the forest. They went on a long cross country trek. So you hear about elephants straying from their habitat or marauding elephants rampaging through fields. You hear this all the time. So there, there is a sort of disconnect that wildlife should right. be confined to certain manageable pockets and that's it, right? People don't understand, people don't get the larger picture. They don't understand exactly what they're dealing with. Sharon, uh, can you tell us something about this story about the tiger temple in Thailand briefly? Um, 
the Tiger Temple um, is a was a Buddhist monastery that doubled as a tiger tourism venue, um, made millions of dollars a year. Uh, you could pet and bottle feed cubs. You could walk with adult tigers. It was very expensive to get in, and there were busloads of tourists. And um, you know, there'd been talk in the press for years and years that they may be trafficking. But a source came to me and told me that she could prove it. So we worked together for a year. We were able to prove that they were not only breeding tigers, um, but were um, trafficking them to, to Laos, to other tiger farms. There was you know, trafficking in and out. Many of the tigers had come to the temple from the wild. Um, and you know, they had created this mythology that it was a sanctuary where, you know, monks lived in harmony with tigers. Meanwhile, you know, they were exploiting them, you know, in a tourist situation and, and, and mass breeding them for the international trade. And um, so I did that story with a woman named Sybil Foxcroft and um, photographer Steve Winter, and we published it with National Geographic, and it kicked up a storm. It was like, media coverage, uh, you know, nonprofits, biologists, and the Thai government received so much flack that within four months they went in and shut it down. And there were, there were 178 tigers in there and they found, mm -hmm. you know, 40 cubs frozen in industrial freezers. They found 20, you know, in large jars preserved. Um, they found tiger skins everywhere. They found tiger skin jewelry. And, and um, so it was even far worse than than we imagined. But, you know, that also opened my eyes to the whole captive issue. Um, you know, prior to that, I mean, I was certainly aware of tiger farming in China. I mean, there's allegedly about 6,000 tigers in tiger farms that are, you know, farmed like pigs and chickens for, for their parts and products. And, you know, their bones used in tiger bone wine are certainly one of the most valuable parts, you know, along with skins and you know, teeth, claws. And, and many other parts that you know have been in the past used in traditional medicine. Um, there is you know an international treaty that says that um, farming tigers for parts and products you know violates CITES, um, but that passed in 2010 and and it continues today. Um, I also discovered that the U.S. was also involved in this cub petting. Um, industry, and I did an investigation here as well. There's somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 tigers here in the U.S. in captivity. The mm. Same thing. This mass breeding, you know, <coughs> pet cubs. They're too big to pet. Who knows what happens to them? There's some, you know, documented illegal trade even out of the U.S. to Thailand. Um, you know, tiger bones parts. Uh, so I think the big issue is that with any kind of captive breeding, and there's other captive breeding of other wildlife species that still does go on. And some of them are um, endangered species. Some of them are potential disease carriers, things like palm civets um, known to carry coronaviruses and you know, other species. Um, it can act as a cover for, um, you know, for illegal trade. And, and or it, it makes it impossible to meet conservation goals because it drives demand. So if there's, you know, tiger farming, you know, feeding parts into the, the trade, then, you know, it's a lot easier to, and cheaper, go poach a tiger. So, I mean, there's 4,000 tigers left in the wild, of, you know, split up among five subspecies. So when you do the math, there's a couple of hundred left of some of the subspecies. So anything that drives demand is a big issue. And, uh, and captive breeding is, is part of that issue. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go very soon to Mike, quite a lot of questions building up in the, in the Q&A, but uh, Julian, you wanted to add something to what Nirmal had said about elephants. Uh, just very briefly. So I think, I think the key issue with the China elephants is also that what's got lost is the reason that they're moving, which is um, you know, loss of habitat. Um, but I, I do think that we can't, you know, dismiss concerns about the damage that wild animals do, particularly, you know, if you look at an African context, um, elephants, um, and particularly in areas where there's been, you know, high density of elephant populations, elephants breaking out, um, do enormous damage to rural farms, rural communities, um, you know, those are people's livelihoods. And I think that there's, there's a 
there's a very contested space between local communities and wildlife because of the dangers that wildlife poses to those communities and because of the dangers it poses to crops and so on. So I think that's another aspect that's, that's quite important to, to consider um, when, when taking into account, you know, the, the movements of animals. I and mean, effectively with national parks that have been set up, we are playing God. Those are controlled environments. Those are environments. You know, this is not animals roaming free. These are, are national parks that have been set up. They have contained borders. And within those borders, those ecosystems are managed. The wildlife populations are managed. Um, so we've got to keep that in mind. And I think it's, it's an important part. Edwin may want to come in on this too, but it's an important aspect in trying to deal with community conservation efforts is how do you make people feel less threatened by the wildlife that is around them? One of the things that- If I can jump in, Sandy, just to, to build on what Julian is saying. And you will find that in most cases in Africa, uh, wildlife actually spend more time outside these uh, national parks in these community areas. That's why for us, it's important that the long-term focus is how do we help communities who live side by side with wildlife uh, get benefit from it, but also solutions that help with human wildlife conflict. They are all parts of the puzzle to communities being the first line of defense against would-be poachers or traffickers. And really, I think it would be an injustice on our part not to mention the, the progress that has been made, particularly on the continent in combating illegal wildlife trade. I tell you, in some countries, wildlife crime 10 years ago was you know, a non-issue, but a number of countries have really worked to surface you know, wildlife crimes and, and bring the importance. If you talk about countries like Kenya, Uganda, they were regarded in some of the among the, the gang of eight, as it was called by, by CITES. But now those two countries have actually been uh, removed from the gang of eight because of the progress they have made in trying to combat uh, wildlife crime. They have put in place policies and programs. We have supported Kenya and Uganda with canine units as some of the key hotspot hubs, their airports, the, the seaports to try and intercept some of the uh, wildlife that's been smuggled out of the country. And as you know, those two countries are essentially a gateway from Central Africa, East Africa, and probably even some coming from Southern Africa as well. So there's been tremendous progress and you realize that it starts with boots on the ground, but that was not enough as Julian indicated. We tried to stop the trafficking, but even when those people are caught, they go to, to the courts, they are given lighter sentences. So there's been a lot of work to try and work with the authorities, even the judicial system to say, you know, how do we, what does the law say about wildlife crimes? And working with protests, prosecutors and judges in terms of how they apply law around uh, wildlife crimes. And we are beginning to see results in some of the cases being followed through in some of the cases receiving adequate uh, sentences, which are in some ways helping as deterrents to would-be traffickers and, and poachers. So there has been tremendous progress, but we, we will be the first to admit as well, a lot remains to be, uh, to be done in this space. As you know, when you tighten things in Kenya or Uganda or DRC, um, traffickers are very clever. They will find another route. So those are the things that we need to ensure. And, Another encouraging thing is the, the inter-collaboration, inter-agency collaboration within countries, but also between countries has improved very much uh, over the last 10 years in trying to combat some of these uh, uh, transnational gangs. So I think th there is room to acknowledge the, the progress that has been made and, and it's encouraging. And if we are able to uh, continue the support I think there, there is room for us to, to win this fight against uh, illegal wildlife trafficking. Sanford, Thank you, Edwin. Over to Mike. There, okay. there, there.
I'm sorry. There. Okay, you have too many. Go questions. ahead, Nermo. Yeah. Mike has a, a massive number of questions. Okay, no, I was. I just wanted to make a very quick point because I think Julian and uh, and Edwin <laughs> mentioned it. Wildlife, con wildlife, human conflict. That's a very critical area, right? Uh, and we find uh, in places like <laughs> India, for example, national parks again uh, are islanded. There is no habitat around them. As Edwin said, a lot of the wildlife spends time outside the national parks. So you have apex big mammals like elephants creating damage. You have apex predators like tigers. In one area where we work, Corbett, <laughs> tigers actually kill six to seven cows a day during the monsoon on the periphery mm. and outside the park. And we and the government, both of us, we provide compensation to the owners of that livestock so that they don't turn against the tiger. That is you know, part of the, uh, the community management. I think that's very critical because uh, habitat loss is not being reversed. It is actually getting worse. So there will be rising conflict wherever we look. Thanks, Nirmo. Uh, Mike, please. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, uh, obviously the discussion is, uh, is spurring a lot of questions and uh, the, the audience is, um, is really getting very, very involved with the, with the kind of issues that, that you're talking about. The, there are some members of the audience for, the, uh, for whom this is quite fresh. So, uh, so Fernanda Herrera was asking to try and get a general sense of the, of the type of traffic. Uh, what about the rhino? What are the, what what prices are we talking about? What what is the cost um, that people are uh, are being asked to give in in order to in order to uh, to get hold of 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 the uh, of the the tusk and so on? Uh, what about the meat? How how much does are, are we talking about? What is the what is the actual the figures? Sharon. Really? Sharon. Oh, Julian, yeah. Sharon, I, you know, there's there's many different price ranges for different products. Um, you know, the, it, it's been said. I mean, I'm sure the, you know, prices fluctuate, but it's been said that rhino horn is worth as much as platinum or cocaine. Um, you know, there's some you know, little bits of various animal products that may be in some kind of tincture that would be a much more affordable product that would be used for traditional medicine. You know, there's expensive jewelry products. There's, you know, there, there's cheap jewelry products. There's, you know, meat that is quite expensive that would not be, um, you know, pangolin meat. It would not be like a normal dinner item. It's expensive. I mean, there's been instances of people eating tiger meat. I mean, it, it it's uh, economically, it's it's the range depending on the products. Um, I don't know if anybody else like Julian, do you have something to, to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, Rhino Horn, the, the price has come down significantly in recent years. Um, you know, per kilogram, it's come down. But as, as Sharon points out, it, it, it varies quite considerably depending on the product. You know, there was a time 10, 12 years ago, we were looking as much as, you know, um, 40,000 US per kilogram. Um, that price has fallen significantly, you know, probably by two thirds um, since then. And what's, what's interesting is there seems to be a progressive decline. Um, why that's happened is not entirely clear. There's some speculation that, you know, the initial, those early crazy prices from around 2010, 2009, were essentially um, syndicates testing the market to see how much the market would bear. And over time, that price has stabilized. But it could also be an indicator that, um, you know, there's, there's um, been, there's too much rhino horn, for instance, on the market, or there's a lack of interest from, from customers. It's, um, it, all of that is, is a bit of a mystery. What is quite concerning is, is how something like rhino horn evolves over time. So what started off a few years back um, you know, or a decade ago with people looking for a product that could help treat cancer. You know, the initial rhino horn is a fever reducer. It's the traditional Chinese uh, med pharmacopoeia um, treatment that, that is, is um, all included in, in traditional Chinese pharmacopoeia, um, traditional medicine. Um, but then evolving into a luxury good, which makes it far more dangerous in some ways. Um, you know, it's not people looking for a cure-all. It's not people looking for some sort of gimmicky thing to use in a nightclub or use as a hangover cure. It's people with money and means who are looking for a status symbol, who are looking for bangles, beads, bracelets, and carvings, collectors. 
Um, and they're a much harder market to reach uh, with demand reduction campaigns or efforts to try and change perceptions. Another I'd, I'd area like to, of uh, I'd like of, to just very quickly. I, I'd like to very sorry, quickly. Sorry, sorry, add, carry on. I'm so sorry that um, the the thing about many of these products, including Rhino Horn, is there's never been any medical proof that they really mm. do what they're supposed to do. I obviously yeah. cancer, but but even as a fever reducer, uh, Huffman LaRoche did studies maybe about 10 or 15 years ago and, and found that it had a mild, mild analgesic, but you'd be better off taking aspirin. So, you know, a lot of this is, is you know, folklore, but there's no, you know, scientific fact behind the efficacy of these products. Jared, uh, Janet, Janet Mann asks, what efforts are being made to reduce the demands for wildlife products in Asia, especially China, but also in the US for precisely those, uh, for precisely that reason, that there is no proof, you know? She says, uh, Viagra did, didn't seem to change the demand for the rhino horn, you know? So what, what, what are we doing, uh, uh, really is her question. I mean, there, there's been some really, you know, great um, programs with the International Fund for Animal Welfare and Wild Aid have done these um, these campaigns that are, you know, posters at airports, they're billboards, they're, you know, PSAs that, you know, uh, and they've used um, celebrities like, you know, Jackie Chan and Yao Ming. They've used business leaders to, you know, tell consumers to not buy these products. Um, you know, I think that's had some dent. Um, I was I was told uh, some years ago that when IFA did uh, a study, um, they realized that much of the Chinese population didn't realize that elephants were killed for their tusks, because in I think it's in Mandarin. In Chinese, um, the word for tusk is tooth, and they most people thought that elephants just lost a tooth. They didn't realize that elephants were being slaughtered for their for their ivory. So, I mean, you know, there's been public, you know, education campaigns. I think it has made a difference among the younger generation. But you know, as Julian mentioned, if you're if you're talking um, about some of the wealthiest and most influential people in the country that are buying these high-end products, um, it's a lot harder to make a difference. Um, also, you know, Chinese medicine associations have, you know, disavowed use of various products. Um, but, you know, it's not like it's stopped completely. Angela, Angela, Angela Preston would, would, would ask, is asking, uh, you know, should there be a pu push for the legislators uh, to get involved in this? And if we are going to have the legislators involved, are they the legislators get to other questions that are coming in? Are the legislators, the legislators in the African countries, uh, the legislators in the, the, the purchasing countries, or is it something that the international community uh, should be doing, uh, the community that is of countries should be doing? Peter, have you got a, a view on that? Yes, I don't think you're going to really tackle this problem and uh, reduce it significantly until it is seen as at least on the level of climate change and uh, cyber security and all of these threats to our future. And so what you need is global cooperation. It's got to be on the agenda of the G7 and wider than the G7 to involve all the countries, including China in it. it it's got to be something that the presidents of the world see as a top draw issue. And we've got to make it that because they won't otherwise. It wasn't until Greta Thunberg and, and others made and David Attenborough made plastic the, the, the issue that everybody now knows about that it got to that level. And we've got to find a way of doing that. But you won't, you won't defeat it. You won't protect wildlife until it becomes an internationally, globally, governmentally coordinated priority. Is that a... If I can, if, if I can jump in, yes, I Michael. Yeah. yeah, I think further to Sharon and, and what Peter said, that there have been efforts even in China, which led to the ban on, on trade by the government. So even at a policy level, there has been pushed, but even some commented that's, that ban was not long term, so definitely more needs to be done. 
but that was an indication that probably if efforts are made to push policymakers and, and educate the public, they could be resulting in reducing the demand or at least policies that could lead us there. Uh, as AWF, again, I think there was a question around zoos. That's another area we are targeting. In, in China, they have large zoos like Beijing Zoo, you are talking of 200,000 people coming in per day. And we are using that traffic to educate the public on um, you know, the impact on, of poaching on the species on the ground. So we have had exhibits providing information and those, are, those have been some of the popular exhibits at this uh, uh, zoos, Beijing Zoo, Shanghai Zoo. So we are, we are using those volumes to try and educate the public in terms of uh, what are the impacts of the, some of these um, uh, trends on the species uh, on the ground. So I think a lot can be done. And also in terms of international focus, I think there was a recent call by uh, the president of Gambia and the president of Costa Rica for a UN protocol that actually establishes uh, international world, uh, uh, wildlife crime as an international wildlife crime. So there are definitely efforts, uh, and, uh, but as you say, we probably need more and more leaders to come around these efforts for, for this uh, to be global and to have buy-in from all parts of the globe for them to be, to be effective. But efforts are under, underway, but they need so, so much uh, support. Nermal, you're, you're nodding there at that. Did you want to say something on that? that one? Oh, no, I'm just nodding in agreement. If I could quickly jump in there. I mean, I think, you know, the, the laws exist. Um, we have the international laws. We have the local laws. Uh, you know, trade in various species have been banned locally. It's been criminalized. You've got the UN General Assembly, which has issued, I think, at least three resolutions on illegal wildlife trade and wildlife trafficking. There's been the Kasani Conference in Botswana. There's been the, the Hanoi Statement, the London Declaration, to name just a few. I think the problem is the implementation of all of that. You know, and we, um, sure, there are improvements that can be made, you know, if you look at each, uh, if you look at some countries where the laws are weaker than in others. But ultimately, um, the tools that we need to do this exist. And it's about the application of those tools and about the collaboration that's happening. So it is refreshing to see, for instance, um, you know, cases where Chinese customs officials are working with their counterparts in Africa, or where US Fish and Wildlife is working with its counterparts, or the USDA or others. Um, but we need to see so much more of that, and we need to use those tools better. I think political leadership also um, has to send the right signals from the very top. For example, I'll give you one example. The national, India's National Board for Wildlife, which is chaired by the Prime Minister, has not actually met in seven years. It's chaired by the Prime Minister. He has not convened a meeting for, um, in seven years of the National Board for Wildlife. So these things matter. And of course, we had a President of the United States not so long ago whose son went, went big game hunting in Africa. Although hunting Pause in... for a moment on that, and it all sinks in. Peter, um, I, I wonder whether uh, this fictionalizing these important issues uh, should be encouraged more. You're, you've just written a book about it, but many, many kind of issues of, uh, over, the, over my lifetime have come to the fore because of uh, the mass media, because of fictionalizing, because of doing plays, we go back to Cathy Come Home and the poverty of, uh, of, of people in our, in our own country in the UK. Would you like to say something about that, about the fictionalizing of, of these things? Well, and uh, give another plug for my thriller, The Rhino Conspiracy. <laughs> well, you've already well... done that, you know. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, the point is that there are very many dedicated people who will read books and articles on wildlife. And there are some political enthusiasts who will read uh, articles and books on politics. But what you've got to do is connect them to get people into a, which is what I tried to do, into a story that grips them. And then they find out about all sorts of other things. So I've had amazing feedback on this, uh, in which people said, oh, I had no idea about the scale of the rhino uh, poaching and nor the political corruption and criminal syndicates around it. 
And that's because they read a thriller. So I do think there's a role for that. But I also think um, there's also a role for, you know, you policy experts to try and convey this wider picture and, and join the dots, as the, as the phrase goes, so that people understand it's all connected to their own, their own actual lifestyles. I think yes, I think create I think the cre oh. the media and uh, creative arts play a huge role. All you have to do is look at uh, the the film My Octopus Teacher, which was one of the best films in the last couple of years. Uh, the, these films and some of these books have tremendous impact, and the more of the we we definitely need much more of it for to reach a broader well, audience. When Leonardo DiCaprio, to support your point, Nima, uh, made Blood Diamond, it did bring you know, the, the trade in blood diamonds for arms and fueling conflicts in places like Sierra Leone and the, D, the DRC and, uh, and Angola, home to people in a way that learned articles just didn't. And I think this is also very important for journalists. And I sort of, you know, some of us try to make the connections. You know, there's a lot of money involved. There's geopolitics involved. There's national security involved. All these things are involved. And these connections have to be made by journalists, by the media, and the popular culture as well. Yeah, I, I would also add, and thank you, Michael, for asking that. For, for us, it's about, it's an intentional investment we have to make. And it's not a just, just about IWT, but for us at, at AWF, we have realized, you know, to address this gap in conservation in Africa, we need storytellers who can connect the dots in a simpler way. So we are investing in young Africans who are into videography to develop the kind of documentaries, films that would be able to easily re resonate with the daily lives of people. And it's been amazing to see how that group has evolved and how they've been made aware of this whole area which they were not aware of and the kind of storytelling that they are, they are coming up with. And, and I think it's a, it's a it's a definitely a tool in the tool bag that we we haven't used as much in conservation. We definitely need to invest in that space. Last year, I, for the couple, last couple of years, uh, one of the you know major tools we have used for engagement uh, with our audiences here in the U.S. was a film called Side of a Horns that was made by a young gentleman who had gone to South Africa and you know got to know about the issues of poaching and, and, and uh, what was happening around. And he made a great film, which was portraying the sites. You know, one brother is a ranger and the other brother is a poacher. And he tried to dive into what was driving the other brother to be a poacher. What the, were the social issues that were pressuring him to be involved in poaching. And at the end, you, you, you find two brothers pitted against each other in trying to combat uh, poaching. So I think storytelling is, is really something that we need to invest in and use a lot more if we are to get the wider audience to understand and care about this issue. Thank you. I'm going to do two, two more questions. Uh, Angela Preston uh, wrote that early, early reports said that the origin of COVID-19 was the pangolin, a highly trafficked uh, animal. Do you think we have learned enough uh, uh, about conservation uh, and about the dangers of, of actually trafficking to, uh, to divert people uh, or to make people aware of the danger itself? That the danger is an, an eco danger. It is a global danger as much as anything else? I think, I mean, just from my side quickly, I mean, I think that what the pandemic has done is it's focused people's attention on wildlife trade. And I think Sharon made this point earlier. Um, you know, it's it's shone a spotlight on wildlife, on wildlife trade and, you know, the danger of zoonoses um, and the danger that we face. You know, this is our first test of of a real global pandemic in a long time. The next pandemic is likely to be much, much worse uh, than what, 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 what we've experienced now. But I think we should also not lose sight of the fact that, um, you know, this is around, this is much bigger than just wildlife trade. This is about trade in farmed animals too. Uh, this is about trade 
globally in, in animals um, and zoonoses spreading and factory farming um, and issues like that. So, you know, I think that there's, I think that certainly there's a, there's a broader awareness of this. Um, and I think it's helped shine a spotlight on the illegal wildlife trade. There are still some questions about what role pangolins, for instance, played um, in, uh, you know, as a host. Um, I see there's a new paper that came out recently, which surveyed 40,000 animals that were uh, traded at the Hunan market in question, no pangolins during that period, but um, several endangered and, and trafficked species that could have acted as vectors for, for, the, for, for COVID. Um, so I think, I think it has helped in that way, but I, I think that there's a bigger discussion to be had about how we farm animals, how we, you know, for, for consumption of meat um, that goes beyond simply just the discussion around the legal wildlife trade. No, I'd, I'm going to ask like the final that. question. Can I, I'm going to ask each of you, of you uh, just a final question that has come in because we're starting to run out of time. Sorry, Sharon. But many people are watching today, and it's quite obvious that they, they feel that just as individuals, uh, what can they do about this issue as an individual who's been watching today, listening to this really great debate, actually finding out information for the first time what can, what can they do? Can you answer very, very simply, um, Nirmal? Uh, make ethical choices. Find out more information about the subjects that interest you, that get your imagination, and then make ethical choices about the way you you live, what you do, and also try and spread that information within your within your within and outside your circle using whatever means you have, social media and so forth. Uh, be open-minded, investigate the facts, and make ethical choices, and, and advocate for the right, the right policies from legislators, from anyone you can think of. Sharon, anything to add to that? Uh, that, that, pretty much, uh, that pretty much covers it from my end. Good job, Nora. Julian? You're muted, Julian. I think Nirmal's touch, touched on it there. I think it's, you know, it's about people taking a stand too, um, you know, um, and, and raising these issues, not only within their circle, but potentially supporting the cause more broadly. You know, they're very good organizations some very good organizations out there on the front lines who are doing incredible work. Um, these are enormously difficult times for conservation and likely to get even more difficult, um, you know, as the fallout, uh, the socioeconomic fallout of the, of the pandemic is felt and you know funds are being cut back so i think you know do research check out you know they, they you know find organizations that are actually doing good work on the ground and support them peter i agree with that support uh, campaigning charities like save the rhino and there are lots of them for all the different wildlife species and go and lobby your member of parliament or your member of congress or your political representative in whichever country you are and go and try and put it on their agenda. Those are the two most important things, practical things that you can do in my view. Thank you, Peter. Edwin. Exactly, just to add to Peter's and, and others, right now policymakers are debating quite a lot about you know, pandemic prevention in the future. So this is an opportunity for everyone to push policymakers and have this issue as a, as a top priority, but also the pandemic has shown us the interconnected of conservation to everything else that we care about. So I think, you know, whatever your expertise, whatever your line of work is, find a way you can con connect to and contribute to, to conservation, uh, because we have seen that it's no longer just a game for, you know, the ecologists, it's certainly everyone's and everyone can, can play a role, whatever background or uh, area of work you are involved in. Thank you. Sandy, before I close, uh, close up, is there anything else you want to say? Well, I would just add to what the five wonderful panelists have just said, that we should all make a particular effort not to participate un unwittingly in this trade in wildlife ourselves in one form or another. Uh, need to be need to be careful about about supporting it. Uh, other than that, Mike, thanks very much to everybody for joining us today. This was a a very lively and and uh, good con conversation about 
a great topic. Thanks to, to Mike and, and the people who help us on the Oxford end and to our staff at the Free Speech Project, students and staff at, at Georgetown and to the university for supporting these efforts. Back over to you, Mike. Oh yes, my thanks uh, please uh, to uh, Peter Hain, Edwin Tambara, Julian Radimir, Sharon Greenup, and Nirmal Ghosh. Yeah, I, it's just been a, a magnificent uh, discussion this afternoon, and I can tell that by the engagement I've had from uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, and thank you, the audience, for for sending in in questions. I'm sorry, not not all the questions were asked. And I'm sorry, I tried to conflate one question into another at times and didn't quite make it. But um, but thank you for those those uh, those questions. Thanks, of course, to uh, to Sandy for for leading this stimulating discussion. At Georgetown, President Jack DeJoy, the Vice President Tom Banchoff, um, without whom we we couldn't uh, we couldn't run these programs. At Blackfriars, thanks to John O'Connor, the Regent, and Richard Finn, the Director of the Las Casas Institute, and Kinga Rona Gabnai, the Blackfriars Administrator, and at Campion Hall, to Nick Austin, the Master of Campion Hall, Sarah Gray, and Ying Ying, uh, Campion Hall Administrators. Also, thanks to Curry Johnson for feeding the questions and and doing the administration for us in the US. So thank you all for being part of this. The next uh, free speech project at the Crossroads International Dialogues will be on Monday, the 19th of July at 11 a.m. EST, 4 p.m. BST, when we were discussing issues related to business ethics, to business ethics, 19th of July, we're not taking a holiday on the free speech project. We're just going on and on. That's right. There's no summer for us, even though Sanford's on, on holiday at the moment. Yes. OK. Well, thank you very much for attending. Thank you all the participants. It's been a wonderful afternoon. I am Professor Mike Scott, fellow and senior dean at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. You can follow me on Twitter at Mike Scott Prof. Until the next time, take care and keep safe. Goodbye. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.